Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope everyone can maybe maybe not hopefully see me, but at least hear me. Um, yeah, we've got today's webinar brought to you by the Southeast branch of the RSM. And we have the wonderful Steve Kerslake from Construction Sport, who is going to be telling you all about the amazing work that he does and, you know, talking around the issues of mental health in construction. And I think the best thing that I can do is hand you over to Steve and let him take the reins as he is the man of the hour. And I will leave you in his very capable hands. So, Steve over to you my friend and yeah yes sorry just briefly we will do q a if if anyone's got any questions please put them in into the chat and we will either field them as we go or at the end so yes over to you steve the man of the hour i've never been called that before i like that one <laughs> yeah I'll do a nice introduction for you. <laughs> just the one hour of course. Yeah. yeah good afternoon um Everybody, so this is something a different approach to what we're doing actually. For a, it's the first time I've done one in this way, so I'm quite looking forward to it actually. But as I said to, I said to Ben, I said to Julie as well. Um, what I will plan to do with you guys, don't be fear, but I'm just literally going to talk. There's no, we've done slides in the past, and being a glorified ground worker, I'm not very good at tech, but what I am quite good at is chatting and chatting and chatting. So I will crack on and go with pretty much telling you guys a little bit about what construction sport is about, um, where the idea come from um my background how i found it and kind of yeah the, the 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 pathway of the last say 15 to 18 years actually and how we've got to where we are today but yeah my name's steve kerslake i'm the founder of construction sport um and i am pretty much just a ground worker in the construction world that kind of went on a bit of a tangent a few years back to try and help the industry with the mental health and well-being problems that we seeing up until today so kind of going back not all the way back but kind of halfway back where the construction sports story started more than my personal one but I was on Crossrail in 2016 working for Costains tier one contractor uh, on the Crossrail Anglia uh, project we were down to do pretty much everything Crossrail related from Stratford to Shenfield mainly on the overhead works going from the tunnel what finished at Pudding Mill Lane um, down to the sidings at Shenfield. Um, I was there for four to five years um, working in the rail sector um, and the hours that we were doing were very much rail related. There were night shifts, day shifts, weekend shifts. There wasn't much time on the 24-7 clock that there wasn't a shift going on within Crossrail and I was at that time in my life was trying to be as much as on part of on as much of that as possible. I was what say uh, mid-20s mid-20s um, my late twenties at the time, and looking to get onto the housing market and buy a house and take life a little bit more serious than I had done in previous years. So, the idea of making hay while the sun shines um, was very much there, and it was kind of a case of sell yourself to the railway and let the rest look itself look after itself. So, I was on cross route, and I know started to notice that come every few weeks, once a month maybe, there was just we were just shattered. I was personally shattered and I wanted to get do something. And being on the railway, giving up my Saturdays um was what I didn't realise at the time, but was probably taking a big part in my actual in my head. But I play rugby, um only not at a high level, but socially every weekend I did at the time and I knocked that on its head to pretty much um, work and that was the kind of the downfall at the time but what I then learned was how much I needed rugby but I could feel myself and see myself the only way I was getting rid of built up tension and going out and let off steam was literally by going out and drinking on a one night that I'd have off we were taking 72 hours a week we'd do six 12 hour shifts we'd have to have the seventh one off if we were on 12 hours at the time and I'd literally go out and just, yeah, have too many drinks, cause too much trouble, and then go home, spend the day apologising, the day after that, go back to work. And I, I started to identify that was not the ideal way, um, starting to get a bit sick and tired of that way. But what I did notice was everyone I worked with was in the same boat. We all had these unsociable hours we work, and the times we wanted to socialise was quite unsociable to our friends and family. So we'd end up drinking on your own and becoming a bit of a, a strange kind of character. But I realised that something needed to be done. Um, there was nothing at the time that I'd seen or identified in construction alone, even with regards to mental health and well-being. It wasn't really being spoken about in the areas I was working in. 
But I thought I want to do something. So I put together an event in 2016 and we walked from Shenfield, uh, sorry, from Reading, um, what was the furthest western point of Crossrail. And we walked to Shenfield being the most eastern, but we actually done it via Abbey Wood as well, where it branches off around Liverpool Street, Canary Wharf area. Um, and we, yeah, I went about it. I said, let's do an event. I've done a few charity events in the past where we just done stuff what kind of everyone had kind of done in a way. London to Paris bike rides, we'd done certain London to Brighton bike rides, certain treks that have always been done. So I thought, let's do something unique and different that no one else has ever done before. So we walked it. We've done 100 miles over three days and we walked um, pretty much 12, 13 hours a day, not realising just how hard walking actually is when it comes to it. We walked um, from station to station on the footpaths, not down the railway line itself. But we walked from station to station and I managed to get every single sponsor, every single station along that route sponsored. Now that route was, um, took in I think 50 companies and we all got just a small sponsorship from all of them, but a lot of companies put a little bit of contribution and we raised, in a case of two or three weeks fundraising, raised just short of 13,000 pounds or 14,000 pounds, I think it was, of which was all donated directly to Macmillan because that was the charity of the project. And a few of us in the backgrounds had all been affected or touched by Macmillan's work in in, 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 the, in recent years as well. So that was quite a nice thing for us all to do, a little bit of show of giving back to them. But what I didn't realise on that walk was that one of the guys had recently lost his granddad or uncle, I think it was, um, and was having a bit of a tough time. But that was the reason why he wanted to do it. So he wanted to help the fact that he had a few, he was grieving, shall we say, because he's, he'd lost a family member and he wanted to do everything he can to make them proud and support the nurses from Macmillan that had supported him. They then, there was also another guy on that um, on that trek and he was a very good pal of mine and still is to this day. I just spoke to him last week, funny enough. And he was, he, I say he's six foot two, 17, 18 stone, big, tough, strong man, big P-way engineer, works on the railway. You see him before you hear him. So you, you hear him before you see him. Um, and he just goes, he's the big, the big strong man on the railway track. He's the stereotypical guy you say is the, the stereotypical person construction of big, tough guys who are soft at heart. And he is this tough guy, but what happened on this trek was kind of what laid the pathway for what was to come really. But he was going through a hell of a lot away from work and none of us knew about this at all. And on day two of the, the walk, he just had enough and said, I just need to put my headphones on and just get through tomorrow. My legs are knackered. We will, uh, we've massively underestimated the the, the, the the challenge of just walking for three days, especially when it's 33 miles a day. But he'd done it and he trekked the third day with his head down, with a map in his hand. He walked off in front of everybody so he could just have his own time. Um, and he just went completely quiet. And it, we all knew he was in a space where he just needed to be kind of a little tap on the shoulder, but just let him do what he needs to do. And it was only at the finish line that it come to light that he was having ser serious issues at home with regards to his little boy wasn't too well and had spent the past four years in and out of Great Ormond Street. And I worked with him every single day for, for two or three years before that. Um, and then also a number of other guys knew him as well. And none of us was aware of what was going on behind the scenes. And the reason for that, and he, he even said it, he said that what you've done for me is... On that, so he came to me after the, the walk and said, "You don't realise what you've done for me." He said, "I've every day of my life in the last six years since his boy was born, he was a tough character at home, and he was also a very tough character in the workplace. So he had to be this strong, tough man um, at work in the workplace, making sure that railway projects were delivered and possessions were delivered on time. He was then at home being a tough, tough character to make sure his wife knew that she had his strength alongside him, and his little boy knew he had a strength of his dad and." That was kind of his his way of kind of to to deal with it, the way of his life, and over a number of years. And the three days that we teed up and allowed him to go out and just walk gave him three days of just no weight on his shoulders. Yeah, yeah, the phone calls coming in, but he literally could just think and think and think and just reflect on everything and all the good stuff in life, as well as how challenging the, the past years have been as well. But it gave him an outlook on life from that day. And he said, "Steve, anything you ever do, just." I'll help in any way, shape or form. And he still gives us all his support till today. But I said to him then, and I'd kind of tongue and cheek laughed about it. I said, Chris, it, was, it wasn't supposed to be a quite serious walk for three days. It was actually due to be just a bit of a laugh and the fact that we got the company credit card and we could have a few drinks in the evening. But this is obviously tough. And we were all too knackered for that in the end. By the time we got back to the hotels, we went to sleep. But what it turned out to be was this kind of awakening to all of us that, Christ, we just need a bit of time out. And this is from everything, from work life and personal life we all need just a bit of downtime and that then went on 
And from that day, I realised it, and everybody said, "Call how well that went." The Crossrail project got a lot of press. There was a lot of companies within that who wasn't really bothered. Even Crossrail themselves, as an independent party, wasn't really interested. But as soon as they saw the success of what we'd done, and we got a bit of national press, they were soon in touch with us, telling us, "Well done." But I said, "Well, at the time, you didn't really care, but um, now you're getting a bit of press about it. You want to be involved." So that was quite interesting on realising how these these entities work. Um, they don't want to support you when you're a little person, but as soon as you start having a bit of clout, they, they seem to get behind you, what's interesting. And that's something that we deal with till today. But with that, I then pushed on from that walk, I realized how beneficial it was. Um, the project was coming to an end. Um, I went back out into the freelance world. I finished with Costains and I went and worked on a project called AMK Deepums, what was a joint venture with Acom, Murphys and Kia, a Thames Water project, um, the best civil project, civils project I've ever been a part of. We were pouring 1,000 cubic metres a day of concrete. We were taking more concrete on that job at the time than, than Crossrail and Thames Tideway was taking. It was an unbelievable kind of feat of engineering in terms of civils. Um, I'm very passionate about the civils world and uh, that's something I am a big fan of. And it was great to be part of that job, even though it was a sewage farm and it stunk day in, day out. It was still the best job, one of the best jobs I've ever been on, um, aside from the smell. But the um, what I then discovered on that walk, I then went to them and I said to them, I, like, I need to put together a walk for this for the guys on site. And someone come to me and said, no, I was working for Murphy's at kind of mainly. Um, and they said, no, well, you're here to work. You're all, you're all here to do your hours on site and go home, really. So... The big Irish, the, the big Irish way, and I'll say that because I do a lot of these Irish companies now, and we, we have a good crack about it. But it is literally, and that's the, the way we work, and it's the way I work. To be honest, you put your head down and you crack on. You're not here to to express your feelings and, and do this and do that, and that has got to change. But that is the way of the world, and what the industry is still is today. What we're working, but I went to, the, I got overruled by that company and said that we're not interested in that. So I took it upon myself and went to the management company who was running it all, and that was Kia's. I went to the director of Kia's. I went above everybody's head that told me no and said that I want to do a walk and I really think it will make a difference. At this point, I didn't actually know, but there'd been recently to that conversation I had with that project director. Well, I only found out months later when he spoke to me, but there was a dumper driver on that job who didn't return to work that weekend before because he took his own life at the weekend. And I said to him, this is so beneficial and no one else is doing it. And I know it's random, but I want to take the guys on a two-day walk. And we walked from ACOM's office in the satellite office in um, Croydon. And then we walked to Kentish Town, North London, where um, Murphy's were based. And then we went up to Sandy in Hertfordshire, where Kia's used to be based. Uh, I don't think they are there now anymore, but they had a lovely estate there. Um, it was incredible. And we walked for two days. We raised three or four thousand pounds at the time. And the director of the Kia's who came to me said to me, Steve, the guy, the, what you've done, is quite remarkable. It's only six or seven days, six or seven of us having a stroll for two days, but you can see the difference in people and how much everyone loved it and the camaraderie it built. And he said, we haven't got a charity of choice, so we want to donate this money back to you to go and set up your own charity. And that was kind of their, yeah, blessing from day one. And as a groundworker turned foreman, I was not in no way, shape or form a charity founding operator, shall we say. But I didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do it. But one thing I've been very good at over the years and um, back myself with is my relationships with people and the fact that I don't burn bridges unless they really need to be burnt. Um, but I had a, a, a got my phone book out and I got in touch with an old school friend of mine, best friend of mine who I hadn't spoken for a while. Um, he works in the professional golf world. He come together with me and took lead of kind of the sport inside of it and helped me create um, the charity. But his sister as well, Kerry, she is our founding kind of trustee partner as well. And she's um, she's a lawyer within Oxfam. So she knew all the legal innuendos, all that kind of stuff we need to change things to. It kind of just, yeah, I'd convert it from groundwork chat over to her. Then go into the uh, the right way to say it, should we say. But we got through the charity status. Um, we were kind of sat down, should we say, by a few charities over the years of people saying we wasn't corporate enough, should we say. We're just a startup thing. So there wasn't much interest in what we were doing. But I knew the idea that I had can transform this industry and I really believe in that and that was seven years ago now I think from the day we started writing our proposal to become a charity I knew there was something in it just from what people had, I'd seen firsthand it's not about spending hell loads of money and donating shed loads of money it's about just getting people out there and joining themselves so we created what is now construction sport and um, we got the charity status just for COVID um, COVID hit and then the world that we come back into after COVID was obviously a world that needed this kind of support even more so so the idea of construction sport is to provide sporting opportunities for construction workers and anyone related to the industry or anyone in general just to enjoy themselves. We realise how much pressure goes on in construction and 
we realised that there is not much place for literally people to let off a bit of steam. Um, we're all literal pressure cookers. This industry is built on being a pressure cooker and nothing gives us opportunities just to relax a little bit. But what we're seeing as well from my background of just amateur sport is just how important sports, teamwork, camaraderie and everything that comes with it, mental health, physical health, um, community, sport brings everything to the table with that. And it allows people to realise they're not on their own. And I knew from then, from that day, purely because of probably when I was 12 years old, it must have been, I saw an advert on TV. I'd spoken to someone previous about military or something like that. My dad was ex-military. My granddad was military. And there was a bit of a running theme in the family about it. And that was, that was an option for me. But what I did see on TV was the fact that I could become a Royal Marine and go ski for a living. And I'm a big fan of skiing, always have been um, and always will be. But I realised if I sign up to Marines when I'm 16, 17, I can go to Norway and ski for a living. And that was off the back of an advert on TV. I had no interest in shooting people. I had no interest in going to throw grenades or walking across deserts. None of that. I just wanted to go and ski for a living. So I signed up to Royal Marines. I was a couple of weeks away from actually signing on the dotted line and being sent away to get on with training. And then this was just post 9-11. Things changed and the the kind of the Arctic warfare training that I was looking at getting involved in actually got scrapped at that, at that stage purely because of the demand in the Middle East. So as a, a proud man, I did put my hands up and I admit to this day, I completely bottled it. It was not for me. That was not the world way I wanted to go. And I, and I backed out and I pulled away. And then I ended up landing in construction, should we say. But... I always look back on the reason why I wanted to join that and the reason why I nearly signed on that dotted line was purely because of sport. Now, I've, since then, I've recognised the the ambulance service have it, the police force have it, the fire brigade have it, the insurance world, the banking world. They all have organisations or at least kind of leading parties that manage the these industry, this part of the industries. Um, they want to push people into sport because it helps people train, exercise, have downtime. But off the back of it as well, what we've later on, really discovered is it does inspires the next generation of people to come through and we're in an industry that is massively suffering with um not really getting youngsters coming in or not people that want to be in it people aren't passionate about coming to join construction especially on the ground it's somewhere you go when all else fails but from the ages of probably one years old even lower than that well as soon as we're born as soon as we're at, as soon as we're in this big wide world up until nine ten years old kids are obsessed with diggers they love it that's why bob the builder is so successful that's why digger land is such a hit Everybody loves diggers when they're born, no matter what. But when you go through secondary school, you get kind of get it driven into you that the construction world is somewhere you go where you when you fail. And that is the, the reality of it. I had it. All else fails, Steve. Don't worry, there'll be a job for you on a building site. So I knew from that day that not being academic, that there may be something like that hands on in my life that will, will take me through my career. So I'm really passionate about making sure that these teenagers, young teenagers, and even people before that are aware of how beneficial and how good this industry is. I'm extremely passionate about it, despite being just a ground worker who digs holes technically for a living. Um, I love it, and it's it's a, it's given me so much opportunity, and this is why I really, I'm really passionate about giving back to it and making sure that tomorrow's um, workforce can can come into something what's kind of positive. Um, so, yeah, so I had that. So we got the um, this military kind of thing done it to me, so I kind of said that let's... let's in the construction world, we need this. Let's do the charity thing. I realise how good the walking is. Let's let's come together. We called it let off steam first, and then that then actually just become naturally over time. It changed to purely because let off steam. Every time we had to explain what charity was, it went on for ages. Um, but then construction sport just kind of nipped it in the bud. Um, that is exactly what it is. Construction workers taking part in sport. We have so much sport already in construction. Um, I watch rugby every weekend, and it's backed by. Massive insurance companies like Gallagher's, who sponsor, or we're actually the insurance partner of most tier one contractors in this country. You look across all football shirts, all rugby shirts. At that time, actually, the rugby shirts itself, you've got Northampton, who just won the league uh, last week in terms of rugby, are backed by Travis Perkins. You've got uh, Juicens, used to be on Gloucester's kit. There's um, Steel, a part of Leicester's kit, the chainsaw company, the petrol saw company. Every single page, every single website on um, online, obviously, the had a construction company on it. And it's, it's pretty much still is the same thing now. And that wasn't just at professional sports level. You can see how much it is. You look at the Paralympics. I've just been doing a lot of work with Sir Robert McAlpines and they 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 are a huge partner with it, within the British GB uh, Paralympic team. And if you look across 
not just professional sport. Look at amateur sport. You go and look, watch your local Saturday or Sunday kids teams. They've normally got Dave Smith plastering on the front of them or something brickwork. They've normally got a local tradesman who's literally just backed that team. And it just shows the passion for sport already in construction is there. I just know, and still to this day, is there is a way that we can turn this on its head and get these people realising that this can work for our industry in a way that we never expected. Construction coming together and promoting sport and getting your workforce involved and just driving. It's not even sport as well. It's hobbies and passions. If people can realize what people can do when they come together, I am, I would put a lot of money. We can improve the, the statistics around construction, mental health, just by letting our workforce have a bit of downtime and support it. Our walks and treks and runs and football days and rugby days. We've got a cricket game coming up in the summer now, the first time. The work, the community that they build, we've got WhatsApp groups of, of of guys and girls all together. They don't really know each other, but they've met at an event that we've done based on the same sport. And now because they're on a WhatsApp group, they understand that they have similar interests and passions that other people. Then people come together and just a simple thing like a WhatsApp group tells people that they are not alone. And that is kind of what we're really realising is, is the main thing. And that is the building the community. So that's kind of... Well, that is at the moment, and we're pushing that as much as we can with the events that we're doing. Um, but it all kind of stems, now going back to my kind of personal story for it, um, was what got me kind of pushed with the mental health stuff. But in 2008-2009 slash time, um, I was caught up in a sulfuric acid uh, incident in my local town um, where I live. Um, I ended up having sulfuric acid thrown across my face. It came across my eye, down underneath here, but my eyeball come across my face, done a lot of damage to my chest. And then, um, yeah, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, caught up in a, in a, an incident that I, I did actually have nothing to do with. Um, that's the first time. I'm not just saying it. I've got myself in a pickle a few times. And I've got to put my hands up. So that's mine, but I was not supposed to be there that night. And it just, I was on the wrong end of a, a bottle of sulfuric acid, but I went a few months after that, um, had the right treatment, got the right support. Um, unfortunately, um, the scars were dealt with quite well because of the, the hands of the uh, the doctors that I was in the hands of really was some of the best care in the world, um, the Burns unit I was part of. But that led on six months later to me not really being able to sleep at night. Um, I'd wake up at one o'clock in the morning and then I wouldn't literally um, go back to sleep. I would then wake up or just lay there in bed all night. Um, just mind would be moving a million miles an hour. Um, six o'clock would come. I'd jump in the van and go to work. And I lived like that for a number of, well, probably a year to 18 months before fatigue really started kicking in, before sleep deprivation really started showing me what, what it does to the body. Um, and then I started to suffer heavily with bleeding of the stomach. I won't go into too much detail. I'm sure a lot of you are probably just eating your lunch, but I was suffering with bleeding of the stomach horrifically. And it was kind of something that was getting worse. But being a proud, proud young man of 20, 21 years old at the time, um, I just didn't really tell people just how bad it was and thought I would get through this on my own. I'll be fine. But my girlfriend at the time, I'm proud to say now she's my wife. She knows too much about me, so I couldn't get rid of her. So, and she says, I think likewise to me, um, we realized then that what I'd gone through then, it didn't start to show physically. So I was suffering with the bleeding, but then I started to lose weight. I started to not be able to shake off bruises from rugby, little aches and pains. I started to feel like a frail old man, really. Um, I'd one, always say I'd one cut on my shin, um, what was from a shovel at work, took it on the shin bone, not too much, but a little cut with a bruise, and it did not move for a long, long time. I couldn't get rid of this bloody little cut. It was so annoying, but it just showed my immune system was weakening, and I didn't know what was going wrong. And then we had a big concrete pour coming up, and I had to be there, and I spent most of the time of the evening awake and in and out the so we say the toilet, literally not having a very good time. And my yeah, girlfriend at the time turned around to me and said, you're not going to work. The boys are outside in the van, but I'm not letting you go. And fortunately, she went out to the van and told the guys where to go. I say it all, all the time, but they, it was the most stereotypical Alveda, same pet, modern day version of a um, Groundworks gang. Um, we had Jimmy, the Albanian, Ray, the, 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 the local Londoner with the skinhead and tattoos all over him. And it was they were my family, my work family. I still speak to a number of those today. But they were a tough, tough kind of group of guys. But my wife went out there and literally just said to him, he's not coming to work today. Get yourselves away. Um, and they put their towels between their legs and drove off. And I missed a concrete pour. And I felt so gutted for that because I knew we'd been preparing for that concrete pour for a number of weeks. And I still to this day understand and realise how big what it is when, when concrete comes to town. So I missed that. I went into hospital. 
I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, what is ulcers of the large intestine. Um, for you who don't know, ulcerative colitis is a type of IBS or IBD, depending who's telling you, but I, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease. Some of the, the words change all the time. What's right and wrong, I don't know. But those three letters, IBS or IBD, is what it kind of deems as. You also get Crohn's disease, what's from your mouth to the end of your small intestine. Um, ulcerative colitis is basically the other end of your um, um, digestive system. But I then went to the hospital on this morning and I come out 10 weeks later. I'd spent 10 weeks in the hospital, best part of the summer, and um, I had my large intestine removed. It completely failed um, and it wasn't in a position where it could be saved. Um, they saved my colon. I was attached. I had a stoma on my stomach and I was attached to a bag for just short of two years. Um, and then from then, I then pushed on um, with life to get through what was to come. And I had a number of operations over two years. I twice had 50 odd staples down my stomach for the, for the surgery and how far they had to kind of go just to make sure I was working, functioning properly. After two years, I had the bag removed. I had everything plumbed back in. I had my small intestine built into a large intestine at the bottom end of it. And then that was re replumbed back in. So like I say, sorry if you just eat your lunch, but yeah, one of the best plumbers in the world um, got me back in shape. So I was back in it. But then all that whole time, as soon as I was able to get out and put my work boots on, um, I was welcomed back into the construction world. So for me, it just gave me hope every time that I knew that I had somewhere to fall back on. The company I was working with at the moment, at the time, understood my situation. They realized I couldn't really dig holes being in the position I was because of trouble with hernias and stuff. So they put me through my supervisor tickets. And then I've become a 21 year old supervisor. And there's not, I haven't come across many civil supervisors at 21. It wasn't because I was that good. I think it was because they felt sorry for me. But what I did learn at that time was straight away when I met the guys on the ground and went around the site, I was given a lot of trouble and a lot of stick because I was a 21 year old acting like a foreman. And they let me have it big time. And I will never, no, I say, I've, I've never held it against no one. It was, I was given a real rough time for a few weeks. But then what I started to learn was these guys are angry because they want something. One of them was moaning because he was missing an hour of his wages. And rightly so, he deserved his, his money. Uh, an hour of his wages from overtime was missing. So I went up to the office and said, he's missing an hour. And I argued his point and I got him his hour. And his attitude towards me changed from that day. And then a number of other guys were angry because it was boiling hot. And there wasn't even water on site. So I took the company card and drove down to the supermarket and bought everyone ice creams and a bottle of water each. And I won so many people's respect very, very, in a very much short time. And from that day, I started realizing, hang on a sec, when someone's giving me a load of trouble or abuse or however tough my life is, just find out what the problem is and nip it in the bud. So by doing that, these guys then realized they had a bit of an ally in me. If they wanted to get a message to the people at the top, I was too stupid to realize that I just needed to go into this office and tell them all exactly what the people on site were thinking and saying. And yeah, I could have got myself in a bit of, bit of trouble, but it really started to echo to me that, hang on a sec, this is quite an easy job. These guys want this. I go and tell them they want that. They deliver that. Or we find a compromise and everyone's happy. So I just become a very, yeah, passionate middleman, should we say. Um, and then it was from that day forward, I started to really identify what, the, the links between mental health and physical health was. And I started to really study my stomach and the situation I'd been in. And I started to look into a lot of biology based kind of topics online and podcasts, YouTube channels um, about the links between your stomach and your brain and your brain pretty much manifests stress. So any stress that you get literally gets offset from your brain to your stomach. And that is why, People suffer, I suppose, anxiety and butterflies or whatever it is when pains in their stomach or people get diarrhea when they're not well and or people are under stress and they just start, over the coming weeks, start to show it. And a lot of time I say it's within their stomach that they start to realise these problems. Um, and then I just realised it and I noticed this link between it. And then what I also found out and learned a lot more about was trauma and how the trauma is done, not just in my case, but so many cases in terms of you look at the times now with Wim Hof and the cold water therapy and how that is in place to deal with trauma. Um Everything that I could see and identify just went back to breathing techniques and how you can use breathing techniques to address so many problems. And when you look at meditation, yoga, cold water therapy, they all base are all based around breathing techniques and ways in which you breathe, the way you get ways you get oxygen to the brain. Now I'm just this silly little ground worker who didn't have a clue about anything biology wise, but then I become so, so very fascinated in this topic. And from that day onwards till today, I've been pushing on to say to this industry, we are overcomplicating mental health and construction so much. 
we are throwing millions and millions of pounds across the table for organizations to put together events or not so much events, put together research packages or, or different campaigns. And we're paying marketing companies significant amount of mar um, money just to make campaigns up about stuff when all we need to do is let people enjoy themselves. We work in an industry where, and I know this firsthand because I speak to these managers every day, people can't support their staff as much as they need to because they can't even get their staff paid properly. Well, they can't get themselves paid. Companies are going pop more than ever before. That's because these companies can't deal with payment terms and payment processes and people are being held accountable, different things in the systems of payment terms. It's just proving why it is a broken sector. Now, the teams that we know need support, the people on the ground, the staff that need support, they want paying first. They can't have, they don't want to go and do a fundraise. They don't want to go to a support event with their company to show team camaraderie if it's going to put their wages in doubt. The first thing they want is their money and then they want to enjoy themselves after that. So we realised now that it, I did at the time thought it was just me on the ground who suffered and it was the, all the people in the offices were literally just laughing at us. But now I've realised it is from the people from the very bottom of this industry to the people at the very, very top, that director level, that ownership level of these businesses, they are under so much stress. And that is why we do, unfortunately, hear a lot of stories from companies, especially site management of people taking their own lives on site and off site. Um, and it's just crazy. And I've been very, very loud about it. I think Ben Javier with us. Javier have been fantastic um, over the last couple of years since so I originally met Jack as well, Jack Rumble. Um, sat down with him. And then it's just speaking to these guys that you get to see just how much pressure is on this is on this sector. Um and we, we want to do something about it. And like I say, we don't want to put pressure on people having to invest millions of pounds and stuff. People need to wake up and realise that we can do this by just enjoying ourselves, get to know our staff and support each other. Now, the one thing with it as well, and Ben will say, because I've, I've had this with Javier a few times, but I'm very passionate about something within the Riddor system. Hopefully you guys can help me out with this one, but something with Riddor needs to click or something along those lines need to be put in place to make construction accountable for the suicides that are happening. I've fortunately been part of something this week with the Build Network UK, what's well, a new media channel which has gone out with a gentleman called Andy Stevens. We've just this week released the news um, from Andy's hard work that 507 people that took their own life in 2021, that statistic was actually wrong. That wasn't an Office of National Statistics statistic, despite it being said it was. The ONS figure for 2021 was actually 668. Um, what is more than obviously two a day, but at the same time, um, sorry, it was around 720. So yeah, what we're on now is more than two a day. So now we are on 749 suicides in 2022. That was, that's the last recorded official statistic. Nobody else in any organization with however much funding has been put in place and donations have been thrown at these things has been able to get the true statistic. And we've gone out and got it in a number of weeks just by openly speaking with the ONS. And it's quite incredible, the the the, the reviews, we've, or the reviews, the response we've had this week. Um, and quite interesting, some of the responses we've not had with people who say they are passionate about this subject. But you're not going to find, I don't think, I'll blow my own trumpet on this one, but you're not going to find anyone who knows this subject quite as much as myself um, in terms of understanding a little bit of construction mental health, but also actually understanding every element of the construction world in terms of working in a trade away from the big sites, working for big sites, working in the infrastructure world, working in the rail sector, highway sector, private development, and all these kind of stuff. We now, over the last 10 years, have been part of every angle of this industry. And we know so much, and we probably don't push it enough, just kind of the stuff we've coming up, but we are starting to get louder and louder. But what we know now is, is worrying, and it's only getting worse. And the systems in place over the last 10 years need to be fit. Well, people need to be held accountable for because it's broken. And Einstein, I always say, he says that doing things more than once and then expecting the same result is the definition of insanity. Um, the systems that are in place at the moment in the last 10 years have been put in place have all year on year failed. Um, and if that was any business, it would have been shut down or, or gone under. Um, so I don't understand why the construction industry feels that just pushing the same messages year on year is going to change anything because we have now evidence to prove that it doesn't. But we are speaking to the leadership council, people within that party now. What's quite interesting, I have a meeting next week with someone there. We're at a number of different events. We speak at another high, high kind of level stuff that we're involved in. Um, a number of tier one contractors have started getting us involved with some of their works. 
And it all goes back to the fact that all we want people to do is enjoy themselves. If you have an enjoyable atmosphere, people get to know each other, people get to drop their shoulders a bit, let off a bit of steam, and people realise that they're not on their own. But I could go on for hours and hours and hours. I'm sure Ben is well aware of that and Judy as well. Um, but yeah, I'm more than welcome to to open it up to the room. And if anyone's got any questions and absolutely anything, I'm, I always say to people being where I'm growing up from, it's, I'm quite hard to offend. So please just chuck anything at me in this very corporate environment. Please take it easy. But let me, anything you want to ask, please, please come forward and let me know. But I think that's kind of touched on a bit of everything, Ben, um, about what we're about. But if there's uh, anything from you and guys, then please let me know. <clears throat> well, yeah, I, I mean, I would just echo everything that you said, mate. I think it's been, what you're doing is brilliant. And I think as always, whenever we talk and whenever I, whenever I hear you talk, you're, you're always very honest and, and open about everything that you've experienced and that other people are experiencing as well. And yeah, but like you said as well, Javio and the company I work for, which is Javio, by the way. Um, yeah. We are, you know, we're huge supporters of you and what you're doing and, and everything that's going on in the industry at the moment. So, I mean, for me, I I don't have any questions, but I would just like to say thank you for your for your honesty oh, and it? and bravery for for opening up. It's um, it's brilliant to hear. So, yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much. Just just yeah. to say, I meant to say as well, just how real this topic kind of really is as well. Um. Scary thing. I literally just clicked online. I just got the article up now to see what it was, and it was last night. Someone put on LinkedIn straight away that there'd been a suicide on a Balfour Beatty project, literally yesterday or the day before yesterday. And there's a yeah, I saw that. Oh, yeah, it's it crazy. Remember the gentleman's name now? Was it Peter? Was it? Yeah, Peter? it was. Yeah, my uh, bet from Michael. His name. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just cra it's crazy. We're seeing it day in day out. More and more people are witnessing this stuff on site and off site. Um and. Tra like I say traumas always say that done a trauma is not addressed I worked on Crossrail for four or five years um never once did anyone ask us if we was all right and there was there was suicides happening day in day out on that area of the railway um and we were told we could have two days off but it'd be unpaid so if we want a bit of downtime <laughs> so <laughs> well, yeah there's there's the the harsh world of what we live in but uh, yeah I agree yeah, I so think good. yeah so if anyone else wants to jump in as well but that the figure that you mentioned it's about when you're talking to Andy about it as well is um it's a sobering it's a sobering figure, isn't it? The, the yeah, reality. it's just it's it's now I think the truth with it is what next now? You know what I mean? It's like and we we've got to really not jump on the back of it as the wrong word, but we've really got to just keep on pushing this now. And people like we obviously haven't got our hands off banging the drum for the last few years and we're not gonna stop anytime soon, should we say? But it's just for people to realise that that this can't go on. We we have the, the and the, they're not numbers. So I know we say numbers, but they're they're people at the end of the day. They're husbands, brothers, wives, girlfriends, whatever. That they are people. And we had one just come forward about three weeks ago. But th there was a gentleman took his own life on a project, um, Bloor Home site in Rayleigh in Essex, and he done it in front in front of site management. But it's come to light, and I was told this by scaffolders on site, but then I actually had the family reach out to me and speak to us, and it was all true. He was being bullied by, by senior management. He was bullied, and the, the person that bullied him was then just taken off that job and taken and put somewhere elsewhere. Yeah. Now, now, that was the way they deal with it, because HSC don't investigate it. Because of the Riddor situation, there might be an internal investigation to make sure that legally that they're all covered and they're not going to get sued. But the truth of it is the HSC don't look at it any more than just literally it gets passed over to a coroner. Now, I mean, you know my views on this with the Riddle situation, but how is that a, not a reportable injury, disease, or a dangerous occurrence? Like, if, oh, sorry, it's a disease, or whatever, it could be classed as a disease, but that is something that... So we've got 749 people took their own life in 2022. We've also got 749 suicides in construction that wasn't investigated now if my car kept on breaking down you would look at the you would open the bonnet and, and look at what's going wrong and i don't and we had a lot of backlash with people saying you can't investigate someone who took their own life's backstory that's wrong it's too intrusive blah 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 but as you guys will know as in working in the health and safety space you can you can go on a building site or you, just look at these people's working environments. You can walk into an office or a boardroom or a canteen and you can feel what that area is like. You know, you, you know in the room within five, 10 minutes if that's a good place to be or not. Um, now, I think if the HSC got the power to 
just look into this stuff. And I'm not at all for just going and suing people. I know it's wrong, but companies come to us all the time because they don't know what to do. And we're just a team of guys passionate about the subject. We haven't, we don't know if our answer would fix the whole industry, but we're hugely, I'm hugely passionate about knowing that it would make a significant difference. Um, but companies do know what to do. There's no guidance. There's no, there's no legislation in place where people, if we put, a, if legislation changes so that you have to make sure your working environment is a happy, inclusive, supportive place, people will then be able to literally build that into their tender processes and show what they do for their workforce to support them. Now, without having that guidance in place, people aren't just, people aren't doing anything really because they just don't know what to do and don't want to waste their time. And, and most of the time they haven't got the money to because they're chasing to be paid. So there's a lot of wrongs in this industry at the moment and a lot of stuff that needs to be cleaned up and I'm not, the, I'm not going to wave the wand and fix it all myself, but we're more than happy to voice anything and everything to the powers that be really, because it needs to be supported. There's a big change in government, obviously, as we know what's coming, or what, what, we don't know what's coming, but there's a, it's a, there's something happening. Um, but there's so much now we see is, oh, which wait till this next government comes in, next this next comes in. I'm just like, this that's not good enough. This is this isn't this isn't going to happen in a few months' time. This is happening every single day. And like I say, we're being fed messages daily, unfortunately, about more and more of it happening. But we will yeah. see. We'll put the world to rights and we'll keep on yeah. going on. <laughs> we, have, um, we have a question from uh, Tony, actually. Tony Wood, he says, um, says, great talk, Steve. As it can be with other areas within construction, are you finding that more sites are looking to push mental health and the need to support along with other activities that will help outside of the working environment? Do you also think that this may... this Sorry, do you also think that this may also need to be pushed through various accreditation schemes? Yeah, so we got a few. We've we've noted we're getting it is getting busier our end for sure. And I think we had an influx of businesses get in touch two months ago. And with the actual funny enough with it, there was a pattern that they were all based in London. These companies, there was three or four companies all in the same week got in touch with us. They're all linked to one job and there was a fatality on that job. So it was reactive again. And that was kind of what we see. We've had companies who spoke with us last year and wanted to do stuff with us who now speaking to us two or three weeks ago and said, oh, I was going to do it last year, but we didn't get around to it, but we've just lost someone on site. So everything's just being so done reactively. Um, we really want to push proactiveness and we, we, we actually went, there was a fundraiser for us last year, last year, last week, two weeks ago. And a big group of business owners, 26 of them, all wanted to push this topic within their companies and then chose us to support. And they drove vintage tractors, believe it or not, from London to Donegal. Um, it was an incredible trip. But I got talking to someone on that trip who was a rescue diver um, in his volunteer times as a volunteer rescue diver outside of construction, outside of his day job. Um, and he had seen firsthand on multiple occasions exactly the aftermath of of suicide, shall we say. Um but he said to us, he said, you've got it so right. He said, and from his experience of what he's dealt with, even obviously what he sees physically doing his job, but mentally what he then has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis of what he's seen. He said, you've got it bang on. He said, this isn't even proactive. This is way before that. This is not allowing anyone to get into any place where they think we need to do something for our mental health. People should just feel like they need to do something because it's good and right to do. And it, people, if people are fit and healthy, then mental health was, will look after itself. I think that's what we, it's, it's tough. And I know that, but if people realize you've got to, you've got to have an outlet. Um, and that's what we say to companies now. And you look at like, even sport. We said yesterday, like the pressures in the sporting world are obviously high, but they get pre-season. They get two or three months, two or three months off or whatever it is. There's no pre-season in construction. It's just 24 seven, even come Saturday, you're just kind of getting over Friday. And then Sunday, you're thinking about Monday morning straight away. So there really isn't much time to, to have downtime. And, um, we are seeing more companies come forward. Yeah, right. So and I think as we're banging the drum a bit louder, um, certain things that we are pushing out there, head like, kind of along our posts and stuff we do online. Everything we do is transparent. As you know, Ben, I think we, we've got the new podcast starting in the next couple of weeks. We've got a YouTube channel where we put everything that we do on. Um, we've got all, all social media channels. Us as a charity want to be seen as, as transparent as it is um, because we ultimately know that this is such a sensitive topic and we need to do more, but yeah, basically long answer to that one. But yeah, there are companies starting to come forward now and it's, I think we're in a better place than we was five, six years ago, but it's, it's turning the, the, the curve, shall we say of that statistic around suicides and 
we live in a, obviously not just construction, is it society in general so tough at the moment? Um, it's going to take a long time to turn that, that, that statistic down and turn it round, shall we say, but God forbid um, it carries on going up. Oh, you're sorry. muted. Mute there. Sorry, yeah, I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if there isn't any more in there at the moment. Um, does anyone else have any sort of further questions or just anything that they want to contribute before we sort of call it a day? Scared, scared everyone off. I actually see it. I've said it a few times, actually. It's really interesting because we get a lot of it goes very quiet after I do the talks and I don't get many questions. But then over the coming days, things will creep forward. And then you speak to people again the second time around, or we speak to people individually. Um, then people start reaching out and get in touch. So now if anyone ever wants to get in touch with us, you know, we're we're as everywhere we can be. Yeah, I think that's I think that's important to note as well that it's a subject or a topic like this can be it's like we were saying about the the suicide figure, it, it's quite sobering and it could be quite it could be quite tough to to listen to or to to hear because it, it can bring up all sorts of things. So yeah, I think it's definitely worth saying if you need any support or if you want to reach out that Steve's there and, and likewise for me and for myself, um, you know. But why don't you, Ben, Ben, tell you, what, how are you guys seeing it? Are you, are you feel seeing more from the health and safety perspective across companies that you're working with? That same kind of question. That it's, um, I think your point was very, it was poignant, was that you can you can sense how people are when you're there, you can tell that quite quickly what the culture is like and how people are feeling. Um, I think in general, I think I think it's positive out there at the moment. It's, I, yeah, I'm not saying that it's not tough. There's lots, like you say, lots of people, lots of companies going down and, and stuff like that. But in general, I think it's okay. But yep. always more that can be done, I think. Yeah. From my perspective. No, yeah. fair play. Good stuff. Well, yeah. Massive, massive thank you for having me, though. Yeah, to yourself, Ben, for asking me to come along and I R R S M, is it? Am I getting it right? I R S M. Yeah, no, RSM. RSM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, huge thank you for having me. Like I say, if anyone wants to reach out, get in touch. We're, we're across all social media. I'm quite heavily on LinkedIn. Apologize if you're with me on LinkedIn because I'm quite heavy on it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like in the, um, in the chat as well, and I'll. Um... Yeah, like you say, people can find you on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, we've got no more questions um, or that, that I can see. So yeah, I think if if that's if you've got nothing else, Steve, I think maybe we'll let people get on and yeah, yeah, no, leave brilliant. it as thank you very much for for your time as well. I appreciate you. Yeah, no, it. it's brilliant. I'd say every time we get the opportunity to speak to an audience and take it really, it, it's exactly what's got us where we are today. So yeah, we only get one person out of the, one person a week out of an audience it helps us push forward for another month or two. So <laughs> yeah. we need all the support we can get. Without a doubt. Yeah, well, I'll put your, your link in there. And like, uh, like we said at the beginning, this will be up on YouTube. So, and we'll share that as well. And it'll, it'll go all over our LinkedIn as well. So yeah, thank you very much, mate. I really appreciate it. Safe travels, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>